First, uh, I'd like to do a brief introduction. Before I do that, I'd really like to thank Chris Johnson and Steve Root. Uh, our guest today has had a chance to meet with Martin and Greg Jones and Chris. I really want to thank all of them for coming. It's, it's a delight to introduce Dr. Mike Lee Galinsky. Mike is based in Perth, Australia, about as far away from here as we could get, of course, about 15 hours ahead of us. And uh, we're delighted he's come here because he's, uh, he's going to give you a very interesting talk today. Let me give you a little background. He's with the Office of the Chief Executive Science Leader at CSIRO, which I think almost probably all of you know is basically the equivalent of uh, the National Lab System of Australia. He's part of the Earth Science and Engineering Group there. Background-wise, in 1983, Michael did his PhD in Physics at Case Western, Ohio. That's undergraduate. I'm sorry, BS degree. He did his PhD at UC San Diego. His uh, PhD topic, interestingly enough, was awarded the uh, best doctoral thesis by the uh, APS, American Physical Society, that year. He then went on for five years to do a postdoc fellowship at Lawrence Livermore Lab. He then went on to an industry that we're going to be explaining a little bit more about today, Shell International, where he spent three years primarily in seismic processing and pre-stack conversion and subsurface uncertainty, which you'll see in the title. He then spent 10 years with BHP Billiton, and then moved on to CSIRO in Australia about a year and a half ago. In 2004, he was awarded the CSIRO Medal for Achievement, which primarily focused, that award was for his work in reservoir characterization and stochastic conversion. Uh, along the way, I guess he didn't have enough to do, he also did a corporate finance advanced options uh, program at University of Chicago Business School. And uh, he's here in the process of a transition back to the United States in 2012. So we're quite interested to have a chance to talk to Mike. It's always him for the entire University of Utah. So if you would, please welcome Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. I'm going to go in and uh, talk to you uh, uh, today about this is uh, the particular research that uh, really was sort of the subject of the CSIRO medal. And it's probably, I think, this particular presentation sort of dates to the time that it uh, was awarded. And that uh, I've gone and my background is in kinetic theory and understanding distribution functions and how they go and evolve underneath sort of integral differential equations or things like the Boltzmann equation and sort of standard transport. And that when I went back into the particular area of geophysics after I did my postdoc at, at Livermore, uh, predominantly in laser plasma simulation, uh, the one thing that sort of struck me is that people were doing all of these particular uh, inversions and uh, different imaging, which really in the way is an inversion. But they never were going and taking a look at the uncertainty. And if you really go and take a look at what you really want to know in the petroleum and the mining industry, is what's the probability that an ore body is there? And also, if it is there, how big and how small can it be? Okay. There are also auxiliary questions of what type of information can I get to be able to go and sort of improve that uncertainty. And then also, you know, beside that, that if you go and if you're I'm uh, going to go and say, uh, if I drill a well, I expect there to be 15 feet of sand. Well, if you find 16 feet of sand, is that good or bad? Well, and I was taught as a little physics, you know, PhD prop in undergraduate school, that a particular measurement, you know, has no value or meaning without particular uncertainty associated with it. And so I was sort of brought in, they say, hey, come up with a new, you know, sort of type of ABO inversion which is really you know, taking advantage of what the reflection looks like as a function of angle. And I immediately said that, you know, we, we need to go and do this with uncertainty. And this really went back to my graduate education, where I ended up doing a lot of metropolis algorithms in terms that's fairly standard in statistical physics. So it became very natural to go through and develop these particular algorithms. Both like, Started that at Shell and then sort of continued it in collaboration with the CSIRO uh, National Laboratory while I was at uh, BHP Billiton. 
Uh, and what I'm going to do is, is go through and first of all uh, describe an oil field that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to go and talk about the particular uh, first phase of the analysis. And this is kind of even better than normal in terms of the way that it's sort of common to do analysis in the industry. But then there's a second phase of the analysis. And this is really a probabilistic inversion, where in this case it's a fairly simple forward model, where you try to go and understand what the particular uncertainty is in that particular model. Okay? And uh, there are a couple of different sort of phases of this. Uh, first of all, you have to sort of understand the particular sort of transfer function, or in other words, how do you go, and, and sort of the seismic wave, or the natural sort of response function of the measurement. And we do this probabilistically too, so there's a particular uncertainty in what that transfer function is. And you also at the same time understand what the noise level is in the particular data, which ends up being very important because that's, you know, as you'll see, is, in, is, is a critical part of the objective function. Uh, you also end up going, you'll see that we have a probabilistic model uh, with uncertainty. We do that on a location by location basis, okay? and we go and then build in the lateral correlation after the fact. This keeps this a very easy to parallelize problem. Uh, and I think we can go and probably debate the pros and cons of this. But that made this really practical dating back even into sort of the mid-90s. Uh, today, that there are ways you can think of in terms of relaxing this. And then there ends up being what we call sort of the decoration and enforcement of how do you go and add sort of extra uh, sort of geologic character that ends up being sort of needed for the uh, particular reservoir simulation in this case, uh, which in itself is a little bit of a difficult technical problem. And I'll just sort of show you the particular results of that. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the particular oil field that we'll be uh, talking about. Uh, it's the uh, uh, sty barrel field. It's the little uh, green thing here. Uh, it uh, is uh, located off the northwest uh, coast of Australia. Right here is sort of Exmouth, where there's sort of a marine, I mean, a, a Navy uh, a submarine communication uh, place. Uh, I live right down here. This is where Perth is that uh, the particular field, and you just sort of think about this as it's a, it's a sandstone with sort of uh, pore volume in the subsurface. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of a big sort of tank. You can sort of think of it that way, with something that seals it on top. Uh, this is a map of what it looks like. This is high. This will be low. Uh, there ends up being a few uh, wells into this particular field. And, uh, uh, and in any ways, uh, that the particular thickness of it is probably like right around sort of 100 feet. Okay. What's the lateral scale? What's that? What's the lateral scale? Ah, oh, jeez. Oh. So how wide is the field? I'm trying to... Do you remember offhand, John? That would be, that whole thing was probably about 20 kilometers width, I guess. Yeah. No, certain map. Yeah, so this is probably about a kilometer or so across. That uh, the particular, uh, this is, ends up being a slice that goes right down the middle of this particular oil field. Uh, the red here ends up being the particular uh, sandstone uh, that the particular reservoir is in. Uh, this is acoustically soft, okay, it's acoustic impedance, which is the density times the compressional uh, velocity uh, ends up being softer than the particular, in this, which would be a mud rock or shale around it. Uh, it tends to be softer whenever there is uh, hydrocarbon in it, in this case, okay? So that uh, the particular, you know, standard way of deciding how much is there is to take a look at exactly where these particular sort of blue points are, or sort of the hardest points on either side, and also to take a look at where sort of the most sort of negative part is associated with it. 
And so you would go and you'd have sort of a, you think of it as a trough here, a peak here, and then a trough over in this location. And uh, people go and sort of assume that I have a very simple three-layer model, okay? And this is the way people normally go and do their analysis, where there's the same thing on the top as on the bottom, and that you then have a sort of a sand shale mixture in the middle, okay? And you really only go and take a look at what is the probability that there is fluid in here, and people never really take a look at what really the uncertainty is sort of associated with the thickness, okay? Uh, you go and you make a measurement, and this is what those sort of two sort of picks were in the particular blue area here, okay? Uh, this is that sort of peak of the red, and you sort of ask what is this amplitude, and also what is the sort of area underneath this particular peak, okay? And it turns out that that area is proportional to the amount of sand that ends up being there. And that the amplitude you can go and relate to the type of fluid that ends up being in the uh, rock. Okay? Uh, this ends up being this net sand that you can go and read right off of that sort of area okay, associated with that particular reflector. And this is in meters, it's calibrated, absolutely. That uh, also, uh, this, there's a particular sort of sparse spike inversion that's sort of gone behind this in order to sort of take out uh, some of the coloration of the particular wavelet that's in there. But the reason why you do do this is to sort of make sure, and this is sort of a sand wedge model, and that as you sort of go along, this black line is what the particular true value sort of should be in terms of the sand. Uh, the particular methods that we ended up using end up being the particular green here, so you can see that it, it is uh, really a fairly good estimate. Uh, but what's kind of interesting, if you take a look at two of the common sort of industrial uh, inversions, the most common two, one has this blue with this bias when it gets thick, and well, this one has all types of problems. And in fact, for those of you that are familiar with inversion problems, it's getting stuck in local minimum. And that's why it's sort of jumping around the way it does. And just sort of for a, a point of information for people here, that if you ever go and are taking a look at a sparse spike problem, okay, or sparse spike optimization, that there was some work done by the Boshis in 2002 that has absolute convergence always to the global minimum. And that's why we ended up getting employed here to give it the better performance. And the other two common industrial things are using sort of more uh, primitive methods that just you know, don't converge to the point that they should. Um, also, you can go and tell what is in there by the amplitude, okay? And that uh, we can go, and since we've done this inversion uh, in terms of normalizing it to one of, one of the wells, that you can now go and read off what the acoustic impedance changes going into uh, the, uh, uh, the, this particular sand. And you see that this ends up being, would be a negative reflection coefficient of 16% of the energy that is coming down on it. Okay, so there it's in reflection coefficient units. Uh, that's a fairly large reflection. And you now can go and take a look at a lot of the uh, well logs around the area and find out what is sort of the conditional prior probability of shale, brine, oil, and gas. I mean, a lot of times people will just say, let me compare this observed amplitude to one of these and just figure out what it's closest to and that's it, right? Well, you can do a little bit better than that if you end up knowing what the error bar is on that. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, sort of Bayes' formula. And you can compare it against the, uh, the sort of conditional prior in order to be able to go and get probability maps, okay? And so that I think on average now, a lot of people are doing this probabilistic updating. But even at the time of this work in around 2004, 2005, this was not a common thing to be able to go and transform these particular sort of extracted amplitudes 
normalize them and get them into even a probability uh, at this case. Okay. Okay. So this is sort of the status quo. Okay. But when do you need something more? Okay. And what does it give you? Okay. First of all, if you have a complicated model, when I mean complicated, it's more than three layers, and the top doesn't equal the bottom. Okay. And in this case, I'll go and sort of. Uh, I should have referred you sort of about, let me go back here to this particular net sand map and sort of note that this is really red here above this sky barrel one well, okay? And the one thing that you also want to note is if you look at the sky barrel one well, that you, you see that what's on top is not what's on bottom, okay? So one of the particular assumptions and fundamental assumptions is being violated here. And you'll see that the implication of that is that they are putting too much net sand here, okay? Because of the fact that one of those baselines is too low, it says there's too much area in it, okay? So the model is too simplistic that people are using. And uh, there can be even uh, other more, pro this is sort of the, the simplest complication. You can easily think you could have five layers and you know those layers interfering with each other. Also, if you end up having sort of multiple fluid contacts, okay, you have you know sort of gas up here and then oil and then uh, water underneath it. How that's a more complicated model than what you have there. You only have one fluid in it. Why happens if you want uncertainty in how much stuff is there? Okay, it doesn't exist, okay? in terms of that analysis. Well, when I say a larger risk reduction, is that there's actually more than one piece of information. You have the reflection coefficient on the top and the bottom. Those two different pieces of information that can be utilized in order to de-risk what is happening. Because you have more pieces of information, and they really are, can be, independent. Uh, you have particular correlations in the rock physics. Uh, that uh, in terms of things like density and VP or VP and VS uh, that wouldn't be gone and, and, and sort of put in there. Uh, you can go and have some depth uh, sort of changes in the rock physics or you can just have more complicated rock physics models that may have something to do with the fabric of the rock that you're dealing with and that's what's talked about there in terms of the floating grain or it could be something like 4D or multiple data sets. And that can be very valuable because you know that between the two data sets, it may only be the fluids that change. It can't be the rock, okay? And so that can help you separate ambiguity between what's in the rock and what the rock is, okay? But in terms of, I think, what people here that's been, that have worked with NMSA, what we really are talking about is uncertainty quantification with verification here, okay? And it really is no different than what you're used to. But I like to think about it as a data assimilation problem with uncertainty. You have a forward model, okay? You have some prior idea of what things look like. You have a measurement, and you now would like to go and restrict what could happen to be consistent with the measurement to within the estimated uncertainty. Well, uh, what do we end up doing? A probabilistic model-based inversion on the seismic data. We build a layer-based model built off of sort of that sparse spike inversion. We get some standard rock physics relationships which say like there's a correlation between VP and VS with some uncertainty. Uh, we also go and say that we know something about the geology in terms of what the net to gross could be for that layer. Again, where the layer top and base is, and even in certain cases what the fluid is. And then we generate an ensemble of models, okay? And now, okay, here's my mathematical slide and, uh, uh, for this particular talk. And it really is, is sort of, is, is one of my collaborators, James Gunning says, is sort of the equation and we just beat the heck out of the equation, okay? And it really is base theorem. I like to think as a probability commutation relationship where you really are writing something in terms of the joint probability 
But that ends up just being the probability of B given A times the probability of A, or to be able to flip things the opposite way, okay? But in these particular cases, think of A as the particular model, okay? And D as the particular observed data, okay? And I'll go and move uh, the probability of A over to the other side. And what you see is that the probability of the model, given the observed data, is just the probability of the model, which is the prior probability without the particular information in it, times the particular sort of known forward model, which is the probability of the data given the model. Okay? And the, uh, you know, the particular sort of you know, problem that you have is that given the model, we can figure out sort of what the particular, you know, sort of data uh, sort of response is, but we can't go and sort of formally sort of invert this particular relationship, okay? And, but before I get there, let me talk a little bit more about what the form that tends to be used for this is. Well, it's really, it's going to be E, or the, the, log, prob uh, the log of this probability, is just the particular data minus the synthetic data given the model, quantity <coughs> squared divided by the noise level to this, you know, squared, okay? And I think, you know, Dave, you know, other people here from physics, that you start realizing this just has a particular form of a Hamiltonian, okay, over KT, where the Hamiltonian ends up just being the particular data mismatch and the noise ends up being equivalent to the particular temperature, okay? And so the optimum point, you know, that people try to find is just the zero temperature equilibrium, right? But if you stand back, you realize there's a very rich literature in physics and statistical physics about how to go and approximate these things around metropolis methods. You can do many approximations of that to determine step size. You can go and handle boundary conditions with, uh, you know, particular uh, sort of bounded Newton methods. And you, and you also can go and sort of do genetic ways of looking for even different modes in the solution. And so that you can have this huge little sort of, you know, bag of tricks that you can go and immediately start bringing to the table. And, and pretty much if you would go through our particular paper, you can see we use just about every trick in the book. Uh, not on this problem, on, a, on sort of the second problem that we ended up working on. But so what do you end up doing in the end is you go and you make one of these layer-based models. Uh, you go and you assume that you have a spike convolution associated with the acoustic impedance contrast of each of these layers. You have to estimate, and I'll talk about that, what the seismic wavelet is, and that's really by trying to match up to a particular location where you've measured it with the drill hole and look at the seismic and say, okay, I want to go and figure out what that wavelet is. And then you go, and this is your forward model, and you adjust that until you end up, and you compare that to the data, and that you either accept or reject that model using sort of the, the, the common acceptance or rejection uh, criteria in order to be able to go and get sort of a fairly sampled uh, statistical ensemble. And now let me just sort of talk a little bit about, you know, how do you go and get that transfer function? Well, you end up going and you have a particular hole through the earth that you've measured. You can say what I expect the particular uh, seismic to look, you know, at that particular location. And how can I go and adjust that wavelet in order to sort of maximize the match of the synthetic to the data, and sort of how big is the residual then, or what is the particular noise level. And you can see sort of this is sort of the best case uh, wavelet. Uh, you can go and also part of the wavelet estimation is sort of how long it is. So you can go and sort of do a model selection. And so in this case we found that the most likely ended up being, in this case, much shorter than the normal wavelet that people would sort of get from sort of standard sort of correlation techniques. Let me just sort of figure out where to chop it off. But the nice thing is that you estimate the most likely wavelet, which is the red, but you also end up getting the uncertainty in what that wavelet is. You also go and estimate what the seismic noise level is. Uh, which ends up being 17% the size of that main reflector, so that the average signal-to-noise ratio is about 15 dB in this case. 
But we get that by comparing the well log to the actual seismic data and seeing the difference, okay? But I also want to go and say, you know, this is a fairly simplistic model. I mean, some people say, let's go and use a full wave solution. That's perfectly okay, okay? And that if you wanted to go and do that, you just sort of substitute a different forward model in there. But this particular noise level not only has what the uh, particular sort of seismic noise is, but also has included in it the modeling sort of uncertainty. And so that sort of puts both under the same covers in this case, okay? Okay, this is what sort of the output ends up looking like, okay? That before the particular inversion in this case, each one of these particular um, uh, colored traces here is a different member from the ensemble, okay? This is the most likely model that was built and how things looked beforehand. Uh, you can see the synthetic of that most likely model is shown in red. This particular point has the uh, actual seismic that was measured there. But you also see that you allowed a lot of uncertainty in this case in both what the impedance was of the sand and the bounding layers and also the particular position. Okay, And the thing that was kind of amazing to me was we had to go develop our own viewer to be able to show this. And even to this day, you can't go out and get a commercial software package in the oil and gas industry that will allow you to go and take a look at what really appears to be a fairly simple display of what the uncertainty is at this location. The next thing is... When you go on this panel, is after we've gone and added in that extra objective, which is the probability of the data given the model, okay? You see that there's a very uh, fairly small uncertainty associated with the top and the base of the main reflector. Uh, you also see, though, that it tends to be a little bit bluer on top than it is on the base, which is shown also in the most likely model, you also see that the most likely seismic ends up being much closer to the real seismic when you now, and then that isn't surprising because in a way it's the, the, the criteria that's coming in in terms of the inversion. But notice that because this is blue, it's telling you that before we probably, and we had to have overestimated the amount of sand sitting in this particular layer. Uh, we like these sort of spaghetti plots, which sort of is sort of a Jenny Craig before and after. Uh, before you say things are consistent with the seismic data, and then after. Uh, you see that the ensemble of models uh, are uh, close to uh, the uh, real seismic, which is shown in red. In fact, the noise level, you see this sort of 17% ends up being the spread here, uh, just as it really should be. Uh, what's nice is at the well value that was ended up, uh, uh, we didn't put in those results. Uh, you see here what the amount of sand was uh, and the distribution was before we did the inversion. Uh, after we said things had to be consistent with the seismic, you see the distribution. First of all, note it's not a symmetric distribution. Okay, it's not a Gaussian distribution. Uh, but the particular well value really is well contained inside of that particular uncertainty ball. Okay, uh, which gives you uh, and also the probability of oil because it was it's in this case it's a mixed integer problem. It was choosing, if you started with 50-50 probability, you would say at this location it was 97% probability of oil, and there was oil at this particular location. Uh, you can go and, in this case, uh, include explicitly uh, the well information and to make sure that things match. Uh, you see this uh, evidence by the particular uh, standard deviation in the net to gross, which sort of goes to zero as you get close to each one of the uh, well locations. Um, and uh, here you see that we said it was sort of a constant net to gross beforehand, 
uh, with, uh, but would go to the true net to gross values wherever there are the particular uh, wells. You can see that it had above average net to gross here and a below average here. Uh, but after we went and did the inversion, uh, it, you'll have the right values at each of the drill hole locations. Uh, but we'll also now have something that's more representative of what the seismic data is telling you. And so each of the drill holes really is only telling you what's around it within this sort of sphere of influence. And you see now how the seismic data is sort of filling in information in between uh, the uh, sort of known, the, uh, sort of known points. Uh, you can do the same thing with uh, the uh, fluid probabilities of uh, putting in uh, the well control. Here you really did know where the fluid contact is. In fact, it was drilled by one of the particular wells. Uh, but you also could go and see here uh, where the particular, uh, uh, without the well control, what the particular fluid probability is. And it turns out that a constant sort of depth ends up uh, sort of running right across here um, and uh, this ended up being where the particular sort of fluid contact was as it was uh, drilled. Uh, this goes and shows a cross section before and after. Uh, you see that the thickness uh, really in certain cases is sort of trimmed up a little bit like say right here but you also see that coming from here to here things become quite a bit more yellow. Um, uh, and then what's nice, though, is in terms of validation is to say, you know, that this particular result was really generated before two of those wells were drilled. And now if I compare the result to the particular prediction, you see that the result always lies within the prediction. Uh, one thing, though, is the fact that this ended up being 9 plus or minus 6. So this is, you know, sort of right sort of on the edge of a standard deviation. And it ended up leading to a whole nother paper in terms of some of this bias. If you start high, you're pulled down, but never to the correct value. And uh, there ends up being a way to correct for this. And so the bottom line is you sort of iterate the uh, inversion. But again, that's sort of subject of another particular talk. Okay, but now we've gone and done an inversion at sort of each particular point. But there really is a lateral correlation in the solution. Okay, and it matters when you're going to go and ask what is the uncertainty in the volumetrics because that the sort of the shorter the correlation length, the uh, you'll find that the uncertainty goes to zero as a square root of that correlation length because of you sort of have too many independent samples. Okay, so you need to go and put that in, um, and so we have to go and sort of in this case we use the same variogram structure that we had used to creak in the well control. And uh, also at the same time, we changed it from a regular grid to something that would be more amenable to flow simulation in terms of an irregular grid. And so that the particular result ends up being, first of all, smooth and also sort of regridded. But that is smooth with respect to what's known to be the lateral correlation length. Uh, this is the net sand, OK, or the size of of uh, the particular bay. And you can see here though, and I want you to note that this is now down here around about 22 meters when it was up at close to 35 meters before. So there was about a 30% overestimation of what the volumes were because of the lack of complexity in sort of that standard uh, model that uh, a lot of people would use. And now you can go and generate a whole bunch of different realizations of what that particular reservoir can look like or what that bag can look like and do your particular reservoir flow simulation through this particular bag, okay? And then you can say how much do I produce, you know, for this case and this case and this case and this case. We know how much we can get for the oil by the volume. And then you can go and understand what the range is of the value that you could go and get from this particular reservoir. But one thing that always scared the managers was the fact when we said all of these are equally probable, consistent, equally consistent with the seismic data and well control. 
Uh, it sort of scared him because you probably can visually see a lot of them don't look much like each other. And it's sort of the hubris, I think, of the most likely model. And I think we were talking to you, Chris, and you said, just because people see that surface and they give it extra meaning. And I think many times they don't really understand the true fuzz of what they end up they are dealing with in these cases. Um, this is showing you different sort of cross sections uh, going down through the model. Uh, this ends up being a constant I node of the regridded model. Uh, you see that it ends up uh, respecting the particular faults and discontinuities, in this case in the way that it was uh, uh, gone and sort of regridded. Uh, that's very important for the reservoir simulation because you want to know what the connectivity of some of these layers are. But the interesting part about it is that the reservoir simulation ends up needing to have more detail than you can tell from the size. And this we sort of call our decoration. Um, and we went and had, and, and would go and decorate one of these layers so that we put in the particular uh, shale, in, which is the black, and the sort of the average of this particular shale ended up being whatever the average was in the seismic model. So every one of these has the right average for this particular sort of uh, initial realization. So it's like an extra explosion in the uncertainty of, of in this case, how could the particular shales be uh, sort of distributed. And we had sort of this, which we call proportional, which is everything is sort of stacked on top of each other, versus this sort of off-lapping, where things can go and sort of cut down across the particular reservoir. And this obviously can make a big difference in terms of just this geometry versus this, because this eventually can start cutting up the reservoir, okay? But it also can be advantageous because it can also, in certain cases, start baffling the flow so that you get efficient sweep. And we ended up finding, when we ended up doing these realizations for sort of different parameters in terms of the decoration, we found that there was an optimum point in terms of sort of the off-lap angle that you ended up putting on there, and, that, and especially compared to some of the particular proportional decoration that ended up being here, okay? And, I mean, and, and also you could think at this point, you say, well, this, well, how do you know what's going on here? I mean, this has sort of been thrown on. But this, if you do know what type of depositional environment you have, you can come up with some reasonable prescriptions on how to decorate it. Or for those of you that saw my talk yesterday, that from those particular process simulations of how these rocks were initially laid down, that you may also be able to get some ideas about what the texture or these particular decorated uh, geometries should be, okay? And so, you know, here are my particular sort of uh, conclusions um, that uh, we ended up having an ensemble of reservoir simulation models. They're consistent with the seismic data. They're consistent with the well data. They are consistent with geologic concepts, especially in that last decoration phase. They give volumetric distributions, a minimum net sand. Do you have enough sand to complete a well there, for instance, to be, be worth sort of opening up the well bore? It also goes and gives a range of production profiles uh, in terms of what the potential production and also what the risks in terms of development of a particular oil field will be. So. Um, if you also want to, I mean, I, I sort of uh, teased, I think, Chris, I mean, I can give you a little bit of a demonstration of some of the particular sort of software interface. And are people interested in about maybe a, a few minute demo of that, or? Okay. I still have enough time, too, don't I, or? Yeah, we have time. Okay. Time for questions. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, this actually is out there and it's sort of an open source project. It was sort of put out there in Java. Um, there's also some particular papers there on the architecture of it. Uh, it ends up being, it, it's, we sort of called it sort of a take every, anywhere and sort of it was before the cloud that, that this started becoming developed. 
but it's sort of a take with you anywhere sort of workbench uh, that would be deployed and, and that each of the particular services that you'll see that end up being run either locally or some of them can be run remotely as, as data readers. A uh, particular service in this point you can think of as having ability to install and update itself. It has a particular ability to save and restore its state. And it has a particular ability to get and send a message. And I'll sort of go and talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, ways that, that this particular thing ends up being utilized. Uh, but because it ends up being written in Java, uh, it can just go and be launched in this case from a particular web page. And you end up having a selector here, which is first of all just sort of which server do you want to go to or for wherever your particular desktop is, is stored. What's your particular project? And then in the end, uh, what is the, the, um, uh, what's the particular uh, sort of workbench or desktop that you end up uh, wanting to go and sort of open up? Uh, you go and see here. Uh, that I didn't need to do this, but the, the, uh, in this case, but if I wouldn't have already downloaded the workbench or if there had been a more recent version, it would have auto-updated itself. Uh, that also you can go and see here in terms of the installed components, or you can think of them as sort of in, installed services. Uh, there are things like how do you do an amplitude extraction, uh, how do you go and view your data, um, how do you go and do one of these delivery inversions, okay? And there's also sort of a generalized uh, XML editor uh, that can uh, sort of conform to particular XSD schemas. And I'll talk just a little bit more about that in the beginning. Uh, you see here, though, uh, how the particular, this is sort of, I would call sort of, this is what the delivery light, it's what I call sort of one of our Uber services. Uh, in the fact that it's sort of the easiest to use. It presents here how do you set up your particular layer-based model, uh, what type of net to gross do you want to have for these models, what's the particular uncertainty in, in the net to gross. Uh, you also have other things like different run parameters that you can go and, and set. But what ends up being sort of nice here is you can also go and say, okay, I want to go and sort of show the model in this case, I've ended up doing a particular sort of inversion of behind the scenes. Uh, it's going out and getting the data. This can either be locally or it can be coming uh, from a particular remote server. And uh, what you end up seeing here first is what the particular size of data is. Uh, that's in, and then you also see uh, the uh, data sort of before and after the inversion. You see the model here with the particular uncertainties on it. Uh, and then to the right here, you see the model uh, after the inversion. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, yeah. And you can go and obviously see that the uncertainty in this horizon went from 6 milliseconds down to 1.6 milliseconds here, for instance. But also, if I went in here and also just sort of double-clicked on this layer, if I went and said, don't say this is 88 sort of 6 as a net to gross, uh, I can also go and even sort of move what one of these boundaries are. And then if I go and hit sort of close associated with this, you can see that obviously is going to change that spreadsheet to the 886. And we'll have also sort of updated the particular uncertainty in the time. Well, this ends up being sort of, uh, we call the light, or we sort of strip down all of the richness of what you can do with this inversion in order to be able to put into this interface. But there ends up being sort of a higher level of particular disclosure associated with what ends up going into the inversion itself. That ends up being an XML. This is just a little XML editor that's been fired up by sort of the master sort of Uber component. Uh, you can see that all the same layers are here. Uh, in fact, I'll go into, uh, let's see, one of those uh, sand layers that say here on, on the A sand. 
And uh, let's go into the net to gross here. I'll change that to 0.5. Uh, but you also need to note that if I wanted to go and sort of add another element here that instead sort of insert either a sub item or uh, an item beside it, because it has the schema behind it, it knows what it can go and invert, right? So what ends up happening is that when I was going and we're working with the developer, go and make your forward engine, write a schema for the way you want your input, we can go and the, the sort of the more master user can sort of go and fill out what the particular XML needs to be. But then for the more naive user or for just me when I'm starting out one of these, I can go and sort of use sort of the higher level uh, definition uh, sort of associated with it. And so then if you're sort of done here, uh, you can just go uh, the particular sort of save and quit. Uh, and if you note here, that it went and picked up the fact that I changed that net to gross to 0.55 in the XML in that case and sort of updated that value. But you do have to know there are a lot more parameters in that XML that end up being exposed in sort of the highest level of, of this particular um, uh, viewer. Um, and, I'm not, and also there ends up being also an ability here that if I end up going, and this will take a, probably a little while to sort of come up, but what you end up seeing here is that uh, many times after you do one of these runs, you'd like to go and visualize the results in your visualizer. And we ended up going and sort of separating the particular visualization engine from the GUI engine so that this particular component can directly give the commands like it was the GUI to the visualizer in order to be able to go and establish the view. And then at the end, it will go and be able to go and hand back uh, the particular control to the GUI so you can go and further sort of explore the data that you're dealing with. And what it's going and bringing up here is that sort of a statistical ensemble view that you ended up seeing in the uh, earlier one. In fact, you can see the ensemble right here uh, coming out. Uh, it's at the wrong scale, but the uh, uh, particular, it has some smarts behind it. And so it just, well, the last thing it did here was it ended up rescaling things so that they would be on scale. Uh, this should look familiar. This was that display of the average model with the before and after seismic on it. And also uh, here that you end up having, you know, that was the ensemble picture of all what all of the models looked like at that particular location. Okay. Um, anyways, I was maybe in just one more real quick thing uh, in terms of giving you, um, let me just quit out of this one. In terms of the uh, uh, visualization, I'll open up just another real quick uh, demo file and buy it just another minute or two. And this is one thing that we also found probably one of the most sort of useful um, parts in terms of this viewer and it's ended up being sort of adopted by a couple different uh, firms. One is INT and also uh, down under Geo Solutions ended up adopting this particular sort of architecture too in terms of the way that the viewer ends up working. And it really is a view that you have a multi-dimensional data set and what you really want to do is take a look at a lot of sort of arbitrary uh, sort of cuts through that data, okay? So think you have a five-dimensional volume, and I'd like to cut it like this, I'd like to cut it like this, I'd like to cut it like this. Well, maybe I even want to cut it, you know, and get a plane, you know, through the extra dimension here, right? But what you really want to do when you have that uh, is, in fact, what you see here is a map view of a model. You see uh, a slice going this way through the uh, seismic data and then this is a particular cut through the seismic data like this and this the other one over here is a perpendicular cut vertical cut through the seismic data and then in this final window that I'm pointing to here is that one location which is at the intersection of those two is going out into a fourth dimension in terms of what the reflectivity looks like as a function of angle okay, on it but the nice thing is that when I go 
and wave my sort of cursor and go left to right on this cross section, you can immediately see up there on the map where um, that cursor is in terms of the map view, okay? Also, if I go and move up and down, uh, that you go and see that the particular scroll is synchronized between them. Uh, you can also go and see that the layer-based model is displayed behind uh, the particular seismic data. I can go and decide to say, hey, let's go and zoom in on like one of these particular areas and that all three things that have that same coordinates will all go and zoom. It knows that the particular map ones have not been zoomed into. Let's say if I wanted to also get a particular sort of cross-section to the seismic data that went through at this particular time and display it up in this window, you just simply sort of double click and it goes out and gets that data through that particular slice. If I wanted to go and get the inline and cross line through this particular position where the cursor is, all I need to go is double click and it will go and get the inline and cross line through that particular position and also get the gather through that particular position or what things look like as a function of uh, angle, okay, at that particular position. So it's very easy to go and sort of relatively move around and to look at what's going on in a reasonably uh, quantitative way. So anyways, just wanted to sort of go out there and put that out to people and uh, uh, thank you for the attention to date. So. about that particular location 
ends up being sort of the noise. So, so the higher the temperature, the more the greater the noise, sort of the greater you know, sort of portion that you can go and explore. So I would just use it in terms of your sort of as a solution, uh, and more so than saying this is really a dynamical system with that as the Hamiltonian. Don't we'll think of it that way. But a real sign is, and I can give you a very interesting reference from a physics viewpoint, is this can end up being elevated though up to a full path integral formulation, and where you can go and define what's analogous to the action. And it ends up opening even broader sort of solution methods for the data assimilation problem. So it's basically the variation of uh, problems that you're addressing. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, I, I can go and, and it's a great, uh, well, there are probably some more fundamental ones, but it's Henry of Arbonneau, I think in about 2008-ish or 6-ish, uh, had a real nice little physics letter on that. Yeah, that's why I have two questions. In your demo, there was an ability to add layers. Yeah. So what, what's your seismic resolution to be able to see a particular layer? So what's the limitation on adding more and more layers? Uh, yeah, um, th th it's a really good uh, uh, overall uh, uh, yeah. thumb for sort of thickness of the layer. You become really quantitative with it. I mean, it's just uh, that what I, First of all, we do do a particular rule of thumb. It's the reason why we do the sparse by conversion. If I can't see the layer on the sparse by conversion, don't put it into the model. Okay, that's sort of the particular sort of rule of thumb. Okay? But now let's step back from it. And there's a real cool thing. We haven't done it here on seismic conversion, uh, but we have done it on ENM, active source ENM conversion. Because you can't extend the Bayesian method to be a model selection. Right? And that model selection can be how many layers you're putting in the model. And so you can go and say, should I go and have one, two, three, four, five layers in the model? And is that addition of that extra parameter, it's like trying to figure out how many parameters I have in the data fit, right? Should I go and pass? And so you can go and become incredibly very analytic with respect to answering that question. And we have in those cases. What about just working from seismic frequencies and wavelength with your seismic waves and data acquisition? Yeah, you can. I mean, but it turns out though that what you can go and put in the resolution is going to be very dependent upon the noise level uh, associated with it. Because you can put in incredibly small layers if you have very low noise level. And so it ends up being both associated with the size and the frequency and also what the noise level is in there. And you could go and use a particular rule of thumb associated with sort of the highest, you know, sort of working frequency that you end up having in the data or where your sort of signal to noise ratio is sort of greater than one. You, you can do that. Uh, what we end up doing too is that there's also a search and ability and some algorithms you use in terms of a blocking algorithm and so that you sort of see what is the blocking to, to maximize or map to the actual size of the data uh, as sort of a uh, as a sort of function of the number of layers? And many times we'll go and look at that too in order to be able to tell what sort of the, the reasonable sort of blocking is in the problem. So, I'll take one or two more. Can we get got it back just a second question? So, uh, in terms of uh, appreciate your comments on uncertainties. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of reducing uncertainties, information from a well is critical, right? You use the well logs and so forth. So at some point, could you use your approach to say you absolutely need another well and where you need it? No, that's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So you can look at the sensitivity and what happens as I add that extra piece of information. What's the sensitivity of either having that well there or not? because those end up being sort of input parameters. And you can have, let's say, a Bayesian variable with that and sort of ask, what is the reduction in uncertainty and what's the optimum location? That's a, yeah, it's, it's a big use is value of information. Okay, so um, I mean, obviously, uh, now, I don't know a great deal about seismic um, sensing for that. I'm assuming that you have to make measurements over an extended area and you know, some sort of way to 
And so you, what you've demonstrated is something where we can take the same set of data and what it being high resolution getting really assigning a probability towards what's happening in each layer. You know, can you invert the problem and say, if you go to the previous resolution, how much do I have to reduce my amount of volume that I can do? In other words, can you actually say my and more efficient mapping at the same resolution? But it's far too simple. Yeah, I mean, you can run that value of information too. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can go and play a game that if I ended up, right, if I reprocess my data with a, uh, a longer spacing, yeah. uh, uh, what would, uh, you know, and then run through the particular process and compare the uncertainty in one case versus the other, you can ask what is the value of that particular space in terms of uncertainty reduction. Yeah, you definitely can do that. And you have a sense of to, you know, how much you reduce the amount of sampling that you need by one of the more sophisticated techniques? Um, the particular acquisition is fairly highly optimized, both in terms of the vertical sampling and also the horizontal sampling. And if you went and degraded it uh, by a factor of two, you would see almost a destruction of the image in certain cases, because of, in many, it's, it's, it's driven in, in many cases by a factor of noise becomes alias and you no longer can remove it. Uh, ends up being one of the, the, the large determining factors we watch your sort of spacing is on the surface. So um, that I, I know that here that you know you know the you know, the, the uh, particular spacing and, and the particular cost are you go like the square of that spacing. So believe me, people really have had, asked those questions and you know and if, if these things are right on the ragged edge, they sort of be close enough. So anybody else? So if my uh, memory is correct, this is reservoirs the lower cretaceous, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's very clean sand. And uh, did you see like a uh, flash or EV response from this uh, reservoir? Uh, that uh, the particular advantage of ADO in this reservoir was uh, uh, fairly low. Um, it was probably because it was so soft. Uh, there was some particular value seen in a, a companion reservoir, but uh, that in this particular one, uh, we did go and ask that question. We, in fact, you could go and, and do the same value of information. We went and did it with, we could do one of these inversions with ABO and not ABO, see if the probability gets higher, uh, see whether or not the uncertainty goes down. And in this case, there wasn't an improvement in terms of using the two stacks are using the ABO information versus using just normal incidents. But it's because it's such a, sort of an extreme. But and also one thing, the, yeah, it's sort of clean in terms of net to gross. The sands end up being sort of remarkably poorly sorted though. And you end up being saved by the fact that the compaction state ends up being so low. Well. Guess what are the core changes? Seems for me it's very clean. Oh yeah, they are. Where's, if, if, where's you, if, if you look to me, but if you go and take a look at the grain size, like yeah. micrographs, and, and they were these, these sands were CAT scan and A and U, you see the fact there are all types of little grains, and it's poorly sorted, but quote clean. Mm. Now the interesting thing though too, the deposition that this is in was really the case A in terms of what I talked about the other day. And that this ends up being looking like one, you can't even see the differences in these beds because it ends up being a no sediment laying case. And these were ended up being deposited in the sort of the non uh, sort of self sustaining. This is part of the channel net, deep water channel net system. Uh, no, this actually was dumped into a fluvial canyon right on the edge. Yeah. It never had enough slope to go self sustaining. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.